saints, it's great to see you. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. You know, Christmas is a time of enchantment, isn't it? It's this magical time where the wall between heaven and earth seems ever so thin. And even though we live in the modern world, in a world that is skeptical of the supernatural aspect of life, I think we still see glimpses of it in our common culture. And sometimes we have to go way back. And I think of uh, the movie that comes out every week, every year, It's a Wonderful Life, during Christmas. And our family tradition is to watch A Wonderful Life. And I always thought that I had watched the whole movie all the way through. But after watching it this week with our family, as we often do, I realized, you know what? I've never watched A Wonderful Life all the way through. <laughs> I've seen every bit and every different scene of It's a Wonderful Life all throughout the years. And it was so nice to finally watch it all in one spot. But the pivotal point in, in It's a Wonderful Life, and you probably know the story, George Bailey wants to get out of small town Bedford world, uh, Bedford Falls, and he wants to see the world. And, but he just can't get out. He just uh, Family and obligations and responsibilities and loyalty keeps calling him back. And um, it comes to the pivotal point in the, uh, in the movie where he wants to actually kill himself because he feels like his life has just been a completely f- complete failure. But it's the supernatural intervention of an angel who shows up when George Bailey is about to jump off a bridge. And the angel saves George Bailey in, in such a miraculous way. The angel himself jumps in. And it's through that that George Bailey gets to see that his life really does matter. That his life really did make an impact in Bedford Falls. And I thought, that is the story of Christmas. Here we have the supernatural intervention of an angel that shows up. And instead of George Bailey, we have Jesus, who is the one who uh, saves Bedford Falls. He saves saves the world. But it's that supernatural component. It's that enchanted where where heaven and earth meet together that we see all throughout this Christmas story. And so we've been going through this uh, uh, the story of Christmas in in Advent, uh, and we're calling it Christmas according to Luke, as we look at Luke's gospel. And today we look at one of the most supernatural, if you will, uh, events of the whole Christmas story, and that is Mary's pregnancy. I think if there's a a part that is most difficult for skeptics, it's Mary being pregnant, because we we know common biology. We know basic biology. We know that it takes a man and a female to to create a, a human being, to, for someone to become pregnant. You need to be both an egg and a sperm. And with Mary's pregnancy, all we have is uh, Mary and the Holy Spirit. And so I think what this story does is it pushes us and it uh, asks the question is, what is our relationship to the supernatural? Is that just something that we see in the past? Is it something that we maybe kind of believe in, but it's for bi- biblical figures in the, in the past? Or is it a reality for our lives today? I want to take a look at this story and see what is the supernatural uh, uh, in our life as well. So let's go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 26. And this is what it says. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to the city, uh, was sent from, from God. In the sixth month of what? Well, this is hearkening back to Elizabeth. I remember Elizabeth and uh, Zachariah, and we'll talk about them uh, in a moment. This is their sixth month of pregnancy. Was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Isn't that a wonderful greeting? Greetings, O favored the Lord, is, the Lord is with you. When when an angel comes and he has a message and you know Christ, his message to you is that the, the Lord is with you. Verse 29, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. I love that. Do not be afraid. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? 
And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. That's the sixth month, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who uh, was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, in this passage, what Luke is doing is he's showing the similarities between John the Baptist and Jesus. And as we took a look last week in Luke chapter 1, it's the announcement, the birth announcement of John the Baptist. And now we have the birth announcement of Jesus. And Luke is comparing the two uh, birth announcements. He's comparing the two people. And there's incredible similarities uh, uh, with them. You know, first of all, it's the angel Gabriel that is sent to both sets of parents, or at least to Zechariah on a on uh, John the Baptist's side, and to Mary on um, Jesus' side. And it's a miraculous announcement, as well, all, because Zechariah and Mary were old. Um, Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. And then you have Mary, who's a virgin, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then the announcement is that both of these children will be great. And so you see the similarities. However, what Luke is also doing is in highlighting these similarities, he's showing how dissimilar they are as well, how dissimilar... Jesus is from John the Baptist. Because what it said about John the Baptist is that he will be filled with the Holy Spirit at birth. I mean, that's incredible. Filled with the Holy Spirit. However, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's not only filled with the Holy Spirit, he was actually conceived by the Holy Spirit himself, showing how great Jesus is. And the, the birth or the conception of the two was miraculous, but Jesus was even more miraculous miraculous. I mean, Zachariah and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's parents, were old. However, they still had a man and a woman. They still had a marriage. They were still a married couple together. But Mary was just a virgin. She had never even been with a man. So you see how even more miraculous this conception is. And the angel Gabriel says that John the Baptist will be great. In fact, Jesus said of John the Baptist, he's the greatest person ever born of a woman. That's pretty, that's pretty great. Jesus, however, was not only great, he was the son of God. And the angel says of Jesus, of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Jesus is actually the supernatural presence of God himself. After all, he is called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so here we see Luke uh, showing the similarities and the dissimilarities between the two. But let's jump in even closer to Mary's experience here. The angel says to Mary that, behold, you are going to conceive and be with the child. And Mary's response is, how will this be since I am a virgin? She's not doubting what's going to happen. She's wondering, how is this even possible? Because I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. And the angel's response to her is this. Verse 37 says, For nothing will be impossible with God. There it is. Nothing will be impossible with God. We see the supernatural intervention of God himself. I love this part of the story because it shows that God shows no allegiance to do things according to the way that we think they ought to be done. He shows no loyalty whatsoever. If God wants to conceive, uh, have a virgin conceive, to bring in the Messiah, that's exactly what he's going to do, even though the laws of physics, the laws of nature say otherwise. And so Mary asks, how is this going to be? And what Zechariah, or I'm sorry, what the, uh, the, the, the angel Gabriel points to is the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive. The Holy Spirit. And it's this picture that we see of the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary is very similar to Genesis chapter 1, when the Holy Spirit is hovering over all of creation. And boom, you get all of creation happening as a result of the Holy Spirit hovering. Well, here we have a new creation happening. You have old humanity happening on the sixth day of Adam and Eve. Now you have new humanity of the Holy Spirit hovering over uh, Mary, and a new humanity is going to start with Jesus, as he is the older brother and he is uh, the Son of God, um, bringing in a, a new creation. And what you also have is a hearkening back to Genesis chapter 18, 
which is the story of Abraham and, and Sarah, because they were an older couple like Elizabeth and Zechariah, who God had promised to have a child. And he says, in one, God said to Abraham, in one year, Sarah, I'm going to come back and Sarah's going to be with the child. And when Sarah overheard this, she laughed because she was old. And guess what happened? In, in, uh, in one year's time, she had a child. And when Sarah laughed, what God said to Sarah and to Abraham at that time was, is anything too hard for the hand of God? Is anything too hard? See, God does the impossible. There is nothing too hard for the hand of God. And the angel's message to Mary is that for nothing will be impossible with God. See, nothing is impossible with the Holy Spirit. And Luke's gospel shows that over and over again, is that when Jesus is born, he is filled with the Holy Spirit, he is anointed with the Holy Spirit, and he makes the impossible possible. I mean, it's through Jesus that the blind see, the, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and that what is impossible becomes possible with Jesus. As Jesus' own followers and critics said to him is, who can make the blind man see? You know, there's this instance in Mark um, chapter 9 where the disciples who were following Jesus, who were the best learners of Jesus, were trying to uh, exercise a demon out of a young boy. And the father of this young boy was absolutely exacerbated because the disciples couldn't do it. They, they lacked the power. They lacked the know-how, even though they had been walking with Jesus. And the father comes up to Jesus after, after he sees Jesus and says, Lord, if you can, will you make my son whole? Will you heal my son? And Jesus looks at him and he says, if you can, if you can. And I love what he says in Luke chapter 9, or Mark chapter 9, he says, all things are possible for those who believe. All things are possible. See, with God, with Jesus, all things are possible. Anything can happen. And if God is calling us into the miraculous, then it's the miraculous that will happen. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to get everything that we want. Uh, you know, in this life, we still are, the, the world is still under the curse of sin. Even though it's been broken, there's still death and decay. We will all die. We still will all get sick. But the impossible is all still possible in our lives. That the Holy Spirit makes everything possible in our life. So even though that doesn't mean we get everything we want, we still get to live supernaturally. We get to still to, to walk in the miraculous. And that means we don't have to fear anything. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear sickness. We don't have to fear COVID because we can now walk and expect the impossible. It's a part of walking with Jesus. You know, um, around this time, about a year ago, um, we, we saw what I think was a, a miracle for, for our family was, uh, you know, as a, a, a church planter and a pastor of a small church living in the Bay Area, finances can get really tight at times. And it was the end of the year. It wasn't just the end of the month. It was the end of the month and of the end of the year, this time in December. And finances were really tight. And typically we see a lot of funds... Uh, uh, December is like our biggest giving month because, you know, it's the holidays, it's the end of the year, people want to get their giving in. But last year, the giving was, at, at first was like really slow. And we're like, oh no. And we, we weren't making our bills at that time. And we're like, Lord, we need a miracle. And um, we just prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, will you bring in the finances for this month and really for this year? And this medical expenses, uh, our medical insurance needed to get covered. And so during a prayer time with others, and we shared our prayer request with a, a few close friends, like we really need to see the Lord come in. And one of our friends had a word for us. And the word was, it's the check is in the mail. And I was like, boy, if you ever are needing God to come through in finances and you get a word uh, from a trusted friend that says the check is in the mail, that is like one of the best. And so every day I would go to the mailbox and I'm like, all right, check's in the mail, check's in the mail. Every day I would go and there was no check in the mail. And now it's getting towards the end of the month. And right before the end of the month, we got this letter from somebody who used to be a part of our congregation, but has since moved away. But she would always send a check, a, a, a fairly large check in December to just bless us and, and to encourage us and to help with expenses. And 
her card came, her Christmas card, and I opened it up. And of course, you know, you got to do the obligation. You first look at the card. You don't want to be, you know, that kind of person or whatever. And it was a wonderful card. But then I look inside the card and, you know, immediately you see there was no check in the card whatsoever. And I was like, oh, no. And then the end of the month came. And I was like, Lord, what happened? Like, where was the check? And I kept, the, I kept that envelope because she had actually moved and I wanted to write her a thank you note. And her new address was in the upper right hand of the letter. And so I hung on to the envelope um, because I wanted to know her new address. And I thought, well, I need to go send out our thank you notes. And Lord, I'm just going to write this thank you note. And so I got the envelope and I decided, you know what? I'm just going to look inside it. And I don't even know what made me think. And I look inside it. And guess what's inside that envelope? It was a check. And it was a fairly large check. And it was a check that helped cover all of our expenses that were remaining for the year and for the month. And the check was literally still in the mail. Now, how is that possible? That is the supernatural hand of God. Because what had happened is I must have, when I first pulled out the card the first time, the check had dropped and stayed in the envelope and I didn't see it. And there it was this whole time. See, God is a God of the miraculous. He's the one who does the impossible. And he wants to bring the impossible to your life. What is your relationship with the impossible? Do you believe God is still in the miracle business? Do you still, do you believe that he wants to do a miracle for you and in your life? This is what Mary's experience is. And of course, your miracle is not going to be the same as Mary's miracle. God wants to do a different miracle that's for your life to show up in your life. Because you know what happens when the impossible meets our lives? We have a greater awareness of God's presence in our life. Not that we test God, or we, but when the Holy Spirit leads us to a place where only the miraculous can happen, we see the, the, the supernatural presence of God in our life. We get a greater love, a greater affection, because we see the supernatural presence of God in our life. That's what was Mary's experience, and that can be our experience too. Well, that's Mary's experience. Go, let's go ahead and look at Mary's response to what the angel said, Gabriel here, in verse 38. And said, oh, oh there's my son Garrett. Hi, Garrett. How are you? Hello. Good to Good. see you. Are you up for the day? Yep. Awesome. Can you sit right here? Yeah. You can help me bring God's word. Can you um, say hi to everyone? Uh, hello, <laughs> friends. Hello, friends. Awesome. Well, let's look at verse 38. And here we see, after Mary's experience, we see Mary's response. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. Oh, I love this part. Mary, here you see Mary's uh, her position, her posture before the Lord. She says, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. She is here to serve. She is placing herself to serve the Lord. What is she doing? She's submitting. She's submitting to the word of the Lord. And then she says, let it be to me according to your word. She says, let it be to me. Yes, that's where the Beatles get the song, let it be. Let it be to me according to your... Mary is submitting herself to the word of the Lord and saying, I am here to serve the Lord. I'm going to submit my life, my hopes, my dreams, my everything, my desires to the word of the Lord and let it be to me according to your word. Why is this important? Well, it's because of the, the stigma and the shame that will come to Mary because of the word of the Lord. Because remember, after all, Mary is not married and now she's pregnant. I'm going to be pregnant. And Mary will carry the stigma of being pregnant and not married for the rest of her life. See, the impossible comes at a cost with her. The impossible, the supernatural um, intervention of God will come at a cost to Mary's reputation and how others will see her. But Mary herself, being the one full of faith and knowing the goodness of God, that even though she doesn't expect this word, and it's an impossible word. She receives it as the word of God. You know, Pastor Bill Johnson uh, says something about the supernatural that I think is so good. He says there's always a stigma attached to the supernatural. 
that if you're going to see the supernatural presence of God in your life, there's always going to be a stigma attached. Why? Because this modern world says, no, that can't happen. No, you're crazy. No, you shouldn't believe uh, God will do that. No, why are you stepping out in faith like that? And so this came at great cost to Mary, and it can come at great cost to us as well. Because if we're going to go against what society has said is acceptable or possible, uh, then we have to be ready to uh, uh, receive um, or to experience the, uh, the stigma and uh, the social um, marginalization of other people. You know, um, I know people, Jenny and I know people who right now are having to, are, they are believing God for the impossible. And to the outside world, it looks crazy. It looks silly and even stupid. You know, Andrew White, a um, uh, pastor in, in England, both he and his wife have MS. They're in their 40s and they both have MS. But they are believing God for, for a miracle. They really are believing God that he is going to heal them. Um, we have another friend named Elliot who, uh, and that's not his real name, but he and his wife are estranged. They've been estranged for four years, and yet he is still believing the restoration of his marriage. Why? Because he believes in the impossible, the, the, the God who makes the impossible possible. God wants to do the impossible in your life. What are you trusting him for? You know, about six months ago, um, in a prayer time, we got a word that we were going to purchase a house. And we've lived in the Bay Area here now for, well, here in San Jose for the last 12 years. And we are not even coming close to purchasing a house here in the Bay Area. So when we heard this word, we thought, this is impossible. But then as we prayed on this word uh, even more, we felt that the Lord wants us to buy a house in the city of Reading. Because why? Our kids are, uh, Jake and Dawson, are now living in Reading. And then rather p than paying two rents, a rent here in San Jose for uh, half of our family and another rent, we felt led to trust him to purchase a house in, in Reading. Now, we looked at the numbers and, you know, started crunching the numbers. The number said on a mortgage we could afford. So, so we could afford the mortgage because we'd basically pay, be paying rent there anyway. But what we could not afford was the down payment. And so we felt like the Lord was calling us to trust him with the down payment for this house. We're like, okay. Now, this comes at a little bit of risk for us because um, we felt that the Lord was saying, go to the church, make them a part of what God is doing because they need to be a part of this miracle as well. And so we felt a little sheepish about that because we we're like, ah, you know, here we are, pastors, and we're trusting God to help us with a down payment for the house. You know, there's there's orphans in Africa, and you know, you could go through all these different stories of why God is not asking you or leading you in this direction. But in our heart of hearts, we really felt this was the uh, the way that God had, the, the Holy Spirit was leading us. So um, it, it seemed that he had led us to make this ask at a uh, one of our services um, right before COVID. And so uh, it was that service, and I was praying, I was like, Lord, Okay, we're going to, and I was really nervous about it. And, um, but then in the middle of the service, I felt, all right, I'm not supposed to say anything. I'm just to be quiet. And even though it was a prayer, I'm not supposed to say anything about this request. That I'm to trust him. I was like, Lord, we need this, the, the, the finances, like, really soon because our kids were about to move. And we only had this small window of time to actually do this before their school year started and everything started back up for us. And then during the service, the Lord moved our friend Eli to go before the congregation and um, make the request for us. And uh, many of you know what happened. Eli went before the congregation. He made the request. And on that day, over $25,000 came in so that we could put a down payment for the house. Just like that. $25,000. That is the miracle making God taking what is impossible to us that is fully possible to him. So my question as I close, are you believing the impossible in your life? This is the time of Christmas where the supernatural, this story is about the supernatural intervention of God. And yes, Mary's miracle is going to be different from your miracle. 
But what miracle do you need to trust God for? Is it a health miracle? It is a financial miracle. Is it a relational miracle of, of reconciliation? Um, is it a marriage miracle? It is a miracle in your, in your singleness. What is the Holy Spirit leading you to ask? It's not something that you make up. But as you pray and you sense God saying, all things are possible for me, what is he asking you to trust him for? Friends, step out in faith. Step out on that ledge. Step out on the risk and watch the miracle making God do a miracle, something that you can't even comprehend in a way that you can't even comprehend it. That's who God is. That's who Jesus is revealed in this story. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for faith, that faith would rise up, that who you are as the miracle making God, the God who makes possible the impossible uh, uh, Lord lead them right now and how you would have them to pray what do they need right now Father I just pray that you supply exactly what they need at this time and Lord thank you for the uh, impossibility of salvation but the greatest impossibility is that you turn sinners into saints thank you Lord for our salvation and as you restore our lives um, Lord, lead us uh, uh, into your presence, which is a supernatural presence, is a miracle-making presence. Uh, Lord, uh, we thank you for this story and this message of Christmas, and we thank you for this passage, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless. Garrett says God bless as well. Say good. Say have a great day. Have a great day. Dead friends, friends. We, 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 we love you. God bless.